Hello and welcome to my workshop. In this video, we are continuing to do some CNC work with the Snapmaker. This is the fourth video in the series and so far we have learned about the relationship between the path and the cutting bit, how to create topography manually, how to create topography using the interpolate method, and how to use gradients. And we have also seen that taking each individual method alone may not yield the results that we want. In this episode, we are going to combine methods in hopes of getting better results. And stay tuned, because I'm going to show something I haven't shown in the previous videos. For the first example, we're going to jump back to something that I did during the interpolate method, and that is this 25 path topography. During that video, we left things as they are, and once we calculated the depth of cut at each path location, and once we plotted the tool, we saw that the tool is going to cut this type of a profile, leaving plenty of wood to be cut out. In that video, I alluded to the fact that we can switch to the manual method and manually adjust the positions of each path so they cut along the desired profile line, and this is what we're going to be doing in this video. As a bonus, I'm going to do a front profile as well. Let's see how I did it in Fast Forward. This is the resulting grid. Uh, we can definitely see that the paths are more concentrated towards the outer edges and more spaced out towards the bottom. And to see the difference, what I'm going to do is remove the grids and position it at the top left corner and just quickly switch between the two. And we can definitely see a huge difference. For the second example, we're going to go back to something that I did in the gradient video, and that is creating a gradient and modifying it along its path. In that video, I used random locations with random grayscale values, but for this video, I'm planning two major changes. Change number one is using a bit more scientific way of updating the gradient, so that means locating a few tool paths, calculating the depth of cut at each tool path, and using the grayscale value to update the gradient. And that's something that we did in the manual method where we did exactly that. Located some two paths, calculated the depth of cut, and calculated the grayscale value. The second major change is changing the bit. I am planning to use the V carving bit for this example. And because the V carving bit is a pointy tool, our outermost path can now extend to the actual border. With changing the tool, we can also change the location of the paths or the depth of cut of each path. And the way to do it is we know that the pointy bit can touch the desired profile line. So we can either update the path location at each depth of cut to come up to the intersect point of the depth of cut and the desired profile line, or we keep the uh, paths constant and we calculate brand new grayscale values based on the intersect point of the path and the uh, desired profile line. For this video, because I already know the grayscale values, I'm just simply going to shift the paths. And let's see how I do it and fast forward. And this is the new modified gradient, and it looks very similar to what we have here in our previous example. But because we're using a different tool, we're going to find out if we're going to get the exact same results. 
In the third and final example, we're gonna go back to what I did in the gradient video, and that is separate the shape into two separate paths, and each path having its own gradient. But in this example right now, I'm gonna do some more slicing and dicing. I'm gonna be using two different gradient types, and each gradient will be modified based on predetermined locations and grayscales. Let's see how I do it in fast forward, and then we're gonna go into the different gradient types. This is the final shape, and let me explain the setup. We already know here is the lowest point of the overall desired profile curve, so I divided the shape based on that. Uh, next, I use the elliptical or radial tool to come up with an ellipse that will cover all edges of the front curve. And this was the midpoint of that particular ellipse, and so that's my second division line. I also took that division line and calculated the grayscale that arises from it. And then I divided the remainder into two additional paths. So in total we have four paths. For the front and the back, I'm going to be using radial gradients. And let me quickly go through those and adjust their values depending on the grayscale. And then I'll come back and explain the second gradient type. I've created gradient for the front and the back, and I have also taken the liberty of creating guidelines for where the nodes of the vertical handle of the back gradient appear. We're gonna need that for our next phase, which is creating the mesh gradient. The mesh gradient is quite different than the regular radio or linear gradients, so it takes some getting used to. To create the mesh gradient, all you have to do is select the path or the object that will receive the mesh gradient. Click on this button that says create and edit meshes. And then we have to enter two parameters and that's the number of rows and columns. We're going to keep it at one column and for the number of rows we are going to select the number which is equal to the number of paths minus one or in our case 19. The other thing to note about the rows number is that it's capped at 20. So if you have entered 256, because you have 256 paths, once you create the gradient, that will automatically revert back to 20. So we are kind of lucky that our example has 20 paths. And the way to create the gradient is make sure that you are in the fill section and then click on the mesh gradient. Now the mesh gradient has two components to it. And let me go to the word at the top. The mesh gradient has two components. One of them are those gray diamond nodes, which is basically positioning of the gradient. And you can also set the color of the gradient as well. The nodes that are circular and turn to arrows, once you click on a particular uh, gray node, they're basically determining the shape of the gradient. So what we need to do now is line up each gray node with the guideline that we just created earlier and also ensure that the color of the node equates to our grayscale values here. I'll begin from the top and once I'm done I will do the other side as well but I'm going to leave the other side where they are. Only the right side will be adjusted for the guidelines. And I'm going to do this on fast forward. As you may have guessed, I have set the grayscale values of the uh, mesh gradient to equal those of its neighboring radial gradient. That way we get some sort of continuity between the two and we don't have very high spots and very low spots. 
and we are going to be doing the same thing for the front but as we see the front has fewer paths so how do we fix that and this is where we are going to take the mesh gradient and we're going to move some of the nodes to their corresponding location on the horizontal plane that way what we're left with is the exact number of nodes for the exact number of paths that we need at the front and the process is going to be exactly the same i'm going to create guidelines for the front gradient and then match up the mesh with the exact same values that way we get the continuity at the front as well now when i select the front gradient we see that the vertical handle is pointing downwards as opposed to upwards and the easiest way to fix it is take the horizontal one and move it upwards and then expand this one to come up to the right location and we see that each node is at the appropriate path so we now have the, the right spacing and everything else now is going to be on fast forward Now that we have done this, it's time to remove the stroke color and see if there is any areas to be fixed. From first sight, we do need to fix here, here, and a little bit up there. And let's see how we can do this. Let's remove the stroke color and magnify. Now the easiest way to fix it is to use the different handles that we have. So we know that we need to fix this node and we see that this turns into a triangle and this one. So we can just simply take this one and raise it a little bit. When we go down below, we see the same thing. We need to fix this particular node. The handle is here and we're going to make sure that it wraps around the back. And we also see some minor fixes again here, and those are pretty simple. We're just going to bring the triangles to the node themselves. What we can also do is adjust how the uh, path lines look like. I mean, we can use the handles and move the paths uh, depending on how we like it. But for the purposes of this example, I'm going to keep things as they are. Now we have to do the same for the lower portion of it. And the easiest way to do it is once you're happy with the mesh gradient, simply copy, paste it, transpose it, and line it up with the bottom section. Now you may need to expand it a little bit and that's it. Our shape is now done. So we're going to take this to the CNC now and see how all the three shapes look like. I'm going to be using the flat end mill for example one and example three and the V carving bit for example two. So let's see how they look. Let's do a side by side comparison between our CNC cutout and our graphics. Once again, we are seeing a one to one representation we clearly see the rings, or I should say ovals, of the interpolate method that are also easily distinguishable in the graphic. In the uh, second graphic, where we have that dark color right at the edge of the shape, we are expecting a nice deep dive or a deep slope. And this is what we have right here. And let's also remember that for this, we've used the V carving bit as opposed to the flat end mill. And for the final graphic, the join lines between all the various gradient methods are more visible on the vertical side as opposed to the horizontal one. Uh, also, the color scheme of the mesh gradient that we see lighter colors here and here, they are properly represented as waves on the CNC cutout. 
Uh, the one thing to note when dealing with mesh gradients, uh, once you're done with the graphic, you have to do an extra step and that is go to edit and make a bitmap copy. Now let's take some measurements. For the middle graphic, we are at 46.88. And uh, remember that we've used the V carving bit, so I should not be expecting to be above that number. So if we butt our calipers to the cutout, somewhere roughly there and there, we are seeing that we are at 46.8. Which is exactly what we have. And let's do another example, the one here at the top. Although I need to blow it up to get to the very outermost path. Which is at 46.83. And because that was done with the flat end mill, we need to add the diameter of the two. So we're expecting to be roughly under 50 millimeters. And we're going here to there. Here to here, we are at 48.7. So very minor distortion and I'm quite happy with it. And let's compare all methods that we've seen so far. Top right are the manual method, top left are the interpolate method, bottom left are the gradient and bottom right are the combination. We see that for majority of the cases we are preserving the shape that we have set out in the Inkscape software, except for the gradients which give us that uh, pointier nose section or front section. We also see that using the V carving bit gives us a very smooth surface, but a really sharp cutoff here at the back, unless we modify the gradient at the back, we have that little sharp cutoff right here compared to a similar cut right here with the flat end mill. As a little bonus feature, let me show you how just changing the tool bit on your CNC can give you two different results. We are going to focus on the example of a single grayscale going from the lowest to the highest point and also updating the grayscale at specific locations with specific grayscale values that we obtained during the manual topography video. In the Luvan software, I have imported the file twice and the path in blue, I'm going to be using the V carving bit at a target of seven millimeters. And the other path, I am going to be using the flat end mill with a target depth of seven millimeters. Now I've already generated the g-code so let me click on the play button and let's see how they look and I'm specifically going to focus on the back side. So we can see the V carving bit has a much steeper slope here compared to the flat end mill and even though the flat end mill is still linear it is a lot gentler than the V carving bit. And also you can see the other paths right around the back here where the gradient wraps on our boundary is completely different between the two. And that's your little bonus. And now you have four different ways of using Inkscape to create slopes and curves for your CNC. In the next episode, which is also going to be the final episode in the series, we're gonna shift our focus to stereolithograph files. Stay tuned. If you like this video, make sure to like, share and subscribe and also hit the notification bell to get notified of my future video releases. Also, follow me on all social media channels and consider supporting me on Patreon. All the links are down in the description.